every country has their sort of more extreme media sources. They're constantly stoking anger. They're trying to create that rage between both sides and that sense of injustice, because then when you want to ask for something, follow me, you know, over the trenches, then they follow you. That's why I'm suspicious. I think sometimes political elites believe their own rhetoric and they're pursuing these intangibles. They convince themselves of their own propaganda or we put people in office who believe the propaganda. But mostly I think these things are how we build bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis our adversary and get people to fight when really it's against the group's interest. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. While there are millions of hostile rivalries around the world, only a fraction of these erupt into violence. But this very fact is often overlooked. Indeed, it is easy to overlook the underlying strategic forces of war and to see war mainly as a series of errors and accidents. It is also easy to forget that war shouldn't happen, and most of the time it doesn't. In his latest book, my guest asks questions such as, why do people fight? And how can we reduce the chance that criminal violence or war will spring up or stop once it has begun? Having explored these questions in far-flung communities from drug gangs in Colombia to child soldiers in Uganda to criminals in post-war Liberia, he draws on decades of economics, political science, psychology, and real-world interventions to lay out the root causes and remedies for war. Chris Blattman is a professor at the University of Chicago in the Harris School of Public Policy. He is an economist and political scientist who studies violence, crime, and underdevelopment. His most recent book is Why We Fight, the Roots of War and the Paths to Peace, which shows that violence is actually not the norm and that there are only five reasons why conflict wins over compromise. Chris and I began by discussing why there are so many misleading ideas about war, how we should distinguish between visible and invisible forms of violence, and between individual acts of violence and those that are performed by groups. The discussion thereafter focused on the five major reasons for war that Chris identifies in his brilliant book. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Chris, it's just lovely to see you and welcome to the show. Thank you. There's so much focus these days on the Ukraine war, of course, and also in the media. There's considerable attention on wars that are sensational, sensational acts of violence. But wars are really the exception, right? They're not the rule. And we often tend to avoid or to somewhat ignore all those instances where we actually avoided a war that violence did not take place, all the times we didn't fight, right? And so one of the key takeaways, and I have many takeaways from your excellent book, is that while we're trying to forecast and predict whether war will take place, will occur, the most reliable prediction will always be peace. Yeah. So before we discuss the roots of war, Chris, why do you think there's so many sort of misleading ideas mm -hmm. about war. Is it because we are obsessed with failures? Is it because we love these gory spectacles? Mm -hmm. Is it because we don't really want to talk about all the times when we avoided wars from happening, when, when we were able to compromise? Why are we obsessed with this kind of failure and we ignore the successes? So I do think we're drawn to the spectacle in some ways as we should be. You know, we 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 want doctors to also pay attention to the critically ill patients. And the funny thing is is we also want doctors to remember that most people are healthy and and that the critically ill patient in front of them is not representative and 
and and doctors do know that and and that means they're not demoralized and it means that they're it means they're better at diagnosis and treatment than if they just thought everybody was critically ill so but when it comes to violence we and i won't even just say violence i will say like sort of any kind of conflict you take you know something like just take like everyday disputes that you and i could have in 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 norway or the united states you know 95 maybe 98 percent of disputes that 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 bring in lawyers and never go to court exactly people sort of realize just how costly and nasty it's going to be and they decide let's and but of course you know we pay attention to the the big court battles and the, the sensational trials and and so it's it's it is this common it's this common mistake the mistake is not to pay attention to the violent conflagrations it's to forget that it's merely to forget that they're the the exception yeah so this reminds me of uh, some of the work i was doing many years ago looking at court cases in india on the right to food etc mm -hmm. and i was looking at the literature and it turns out that you know the court system is 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 often clogged it's overwhelmed a bit like the united states i would say and yeah. so it turns out the the wisdom that lawyers impart is that if you have a weak case then you go to court if you have a strong case you settle you know yeah like you you want immediate satisfaction but i was thinking also about india in relation to something else i really found interesting in the book and that relates to why we sometimes avoid perhaps talking about the successes and that has to do with the role of interdependence and this interwining sort of interest in preventing violence. Yeah. And you actually talk about this very well-known case of the Babri Masjid, the mosque in Ayodhya, which was demolished by a Hindu mob mm -hmm. in 1992. And what is particularly interesting is that there was a lot of focus on the violence that erupted in the immediate aftermath, but, but in many cases it did not spread. And yeah. in areas where you think, you know, it could have spread, it turns out it did not spread because Hindus and Muslims had economic interests. There were deep social ties, et cetera. Yeah, and but even where those social ties, those social ties and that interdependence is really protective in a lot of cases, just like I think international trade and social interactions are, are protective in a way because they 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 make make fighting even more costly than it otherwise would have been. But but I do like to stress that we don't need that, that that most Indian cities don't have sustained riots. It's it's really just a handful of places that have some recurrent issues, and with or without social ties, and with or without economic interdependence in these cities, it just doesn't really make sense to riot, and doesn't make sense to strike, and it doesn't make sense to revolt, and it doesn't make sense to invade most of the time. There's there's a whole bunch of other nasty stuff you can do instead of invading. I mean, <laughs> I, so I, so peace isn't the peace. The peace that I'm thinking of isn't. Sometimes people say it's you know what I talk about is just what, what some people call negative peace. It's the absence of pitched battles, right? But you know, if you look at the 20 years that preceded Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin tried everything he could, short of invasion, to co-opt politics. There, there was dark money. There was propaganda. There were assassinations or attempted assassinations and poisonings. There were uh, support for separatists, right? All of these things were tactics that were preferable to war because they weren't so costly. And so war was a, uh, a last resort. And likewise, Putin has successfully cowed most of his other neighbors without having to invade them, right? He's completely subjugated Belarus and yeah. Kazakhstan accepted uh, the quote unquote peacekeepers the last year or two. Uh, and, and a certain amount of political interference without a rebellion. And so, so we do pay attention to these, these moments of non-conflict because we're, we're, we're paying attention, but they just, they don't seem very, they still seem pretty unpleasant. All this interference and meddling, right? And the United States and the West does its own fair share of meddling too. A little, little bit less violent, I think, but not much. So we just, we just, I think we just, it helps to remember that that's the alternative to war and 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 that's like this I don't know that's like that's the sad thing that's like the sad state we need to get back to is is nefarious meddling instead of war when reading this book I love the title why we fight you know I was reminded of my uh, British uh, boarding school experience and 
I was often a uh, witness to the occasional fist fight. Uh, tempers yeah. would flare up because we were always hungry, not because we didn't get food. It was just bad food <laughs> because we were denied access to something. We felt insulted. The, the cottage parents weren't nice. Yeah. But what is interesting about that, and I was just thinking about it, is that these were like short-lived acts. So mm-hmm. some of my peers, of course, ended up gaining some sort of a formidable reputation of being, you know, the tough guys you can't mess with. But those were individual short-term acts. And here, of course, in the book, you're talking about group-based violence, you know, groups yeah. that that leads to wars that are extremely different. So can you help me and my listeners better understand and distinguish between these individual acts of violence from those that are performed by groups? So there's there's lots of parallels, but they're they're quite distinct. So in the book, I quite comfortably jump from gangs and villages up to political factions and civil conflicts and countries. And I Mm -hmm. talk about, I focus on the commonalities because as different as they are, I think we causes of conflict between groups at any level have a lot in common. We learn a lot from looking at that. And I, but I do put individuals aside to a degree because I think you're right. An awful lot of A book on individual violence, of which there have been many, would focus on our hot reactive emotional states, fight or flight mechanisms. And so, and and there are so many books on this. There are some that go back and look at our ape-like origins and 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 what we learned from that. There's like Richard Wrangham, I think, is 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 a great example. There are people, there are sociologists like Randall Collins who talk about our microsociological interactions, yeah, and how violence happens. And the fact is, is that just doesn't make that much sense. Like, think about the, the the war in Ukraine, right? It drags on for months. There are vast military bureaucracies that are waging this conflict on each side, and even the initial decisions to wage it, which can be, which you know. It seems like a really relatively small cabal of, of Putin and the FSB probably conceived of this initial invasion. And were they influenced by emotions and these sort of momentary hot reactive states? Maybe a little bit, but of all of the behavioral biases and of all the way we're rational, I think we, we, we're irrational and we, get, we make mistakes in groups differently. And so I, I try to move away from that. And so, so emotion in that sense, plays a relatively minor role in, in the book, which is, I think, what makes it different from most books about why we fight. Another reason I liked your book is the sheer interdisciplinarity of the research that you cite. It's political scientists, psychologists, economists, sociologists. I think that that really makes it uh, very different. But just staying on my boarding school experience, another activity yeah. I detested at boarding school was the annual boxing competition. Huh. It was the first year I think I boxed. I was like seven or eight years old. And my mama told me like, you know, be nice to everyone, smile as much as possible, even if people were mean. And so I'm in the ring three times, three minutes, you know, three rounds, nine minutes, boxing with this tall guy with a huge reach. And he was, you know, beating the hell out of me. And what shocked a lot of people, I think, and I remember this very vividly was, I had this idea in my head. My mom said, be nice to anyone, you know, even though they are hitting you, et cetera. So I was like smiling every time I was being punched and there was blood coming out of my (laughs) nose. It was just very, very weird. And I wasn't really offering any sort of, you know, I was just defending myself. I wasn't really punching back. Right. And so it turned out I got the best loser prize that year. But but the, 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 the point here is that every year at school, Chris, and, and you know, I, and I keep telling my kids, I was the happiest kid on the planet when I was done with the first fight, you know, the first one. And I was always hoping I would lose that fight. Mm-hmm. I never really wanted to win because to lose was my victory because then the boxing season was over. You know, I, you know, I could just go about it. But as I grew old, I realized that losing the first fight wasn't good enough. I had to actually put up a good fight, you yeah. know, because you had to maintain some semblance of dignity, yeah. of some respect. I had to convince people that they couldn't push me around, that that they could also risk being beaten up. So, so that wanted me to sort of put on a good show, even though secretly I wanted to lose. So my question to you is, is such a scenario at all possible at a group level, at yeah. a country level, where you want to secretly lose, but you still want to 
you know, put up a good show. So absolutely. And so, and I, I would, I would say you could, I could, I, I let me, I can tell you a story and I will about a, Mm-hmm. a gang leader I know in Chicago and I can tell you a story about the US invasion of Afghanistan where we essentially used the same logic is it nap in Chicago no this is a different person actually not in not in not in the book uh, although we could we could talk about nap who's in the book the first thing I want to say is that we, we've we said most of the time we don't fight the reason we don't fight is because war is so costly there's just there's yeah. usually a better alternative nefarious meddling or or even just getting hit in the face and then conceding in some sense you're like you know that's just better than having the pain go on right yeah uh if you could just tap out you would have right because what well, you're not going to win you're going to get bloodied tap out and 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 then be done with it now you said there's two reasons why you might not want to do that and 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 two of them sort of get it to the logics that i think why we ignore the cost so the answer to why we fight is our societies our leaders ignore the cost of war and, and you've hit on two of them. So one, you said something like dignity or there, there's some ethereal thing that you think you might get glory potentially by fighting yeah. and only by fighting. So, so that's a potential answer, right? And we hear lots of stories of the, the kings of Europe or Vladimir Putin or your younger self <laughs> fighting for glory, right? Or fighting for some intangible that makes the violence worthwhile. I don't... Uh, and that happens sometimes. I th- I don't think that's the exact story you were telling, though. You were actually telling a story of reputation. That's correct. And the the story of reputation has reputation comes from uncertainty, right? If everyone knew how strong you were and resolved, uh, you would never have to fight to establish your to establish these things, right? You only have to fight in order to signal these things credibly to everyone else around you, because you may face a hundred other fights in future. So this gang leader I met through a program I'm running on violence reduction was talking about how he became a killer. And he said, well, you know, originally when I started out selling drugs, someone robbed me. And I knew that if I, if I let that happen, I was going to get killed or I just have to get out of the business. And, and so I realized that I had to establish a reputation. So I tracked them down and I killed them. And I had to do that a few more times. And then I had a reputation as a killer and nobody robbed me anymore. And, but he was regretful about it because it had changed him. He wasn't happy with the person and he'd become in that choice, but nonetheless, he made it for this very calculating reason. It wasn't a hot reactive passion for the most part. And he wasn't seeking glory. And, and like, I think you could make the same argument about the US in Afghanistan. There were lots of mistakes and maybe there was, they weren't pursuing glory, but revenge. So there was an intangible there, but uh, the US was seen as weak in the sense of not willing to put American soldiers on the line, not willing to be the world's real policeman, not willing to go beyond bombing someone like, someone like Saddam Hussein or, or in Kosovo. And, and, and so they could be attacked on their own soil without really facing any consequences. And the invasion of Afghanistan was an opportunity to demonstrate that no, that was a red line that could not be crossed. And then even when you're losing, as they were, they were getting bloodied in the face eventually, right? Not initially, but from about 2006 onwards, they stayed in the ring to demonstrate that resolve, that this is how painful we will make it for a society that condones or endorses or somehow supports an attack on American soil. And, and that the message was, was, was to every future possible pariah state or terror group. And that's not the only reason I think they stayed, but I think that's the, one of the most Im- important. So these di- that's a good example of dynamics that are true at the individual level that I think are true at all these other levels too. But don't you think that red line has sort of changed somewhat in the Ukraine war that with NATO, um, NATO member states not wanting to be involved, the US also not wanting to be directly involved. Do you think there's been some sort of a lesson learned from Afghanistan in, in relation to what's happening at the moment? One is more cautious, maybe? Well, listen, the lesson we learned in Iraq and Afghanistan to me is the same lesson that we we haven't, we haven't, nothing's changed. The lesson 
the lesson was that a great power, a, a, someone, a nuclear armed member of the veto wielding member of the UN Security Council can invade another country without the support of the United Nations illegally. Yeah. Uh, if they deem it's in their national interests, that's the US established that in Iraq and, and and you can argue that's justified or not but but that's that's what they did and and so so and and the rest of the world some of them condemned them some of them supported them and 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 uh but they didn't they didn't fight back i, I it's possible and and Russia did the same with the seizure of Crimea and so it may be that the lesson that Russia drew was that it was it was not going to face significant resistance that's the gamble that that i think this initial invasion was this it was a gamble that one the west would would not put a lot on the line and it was a gamble that ukrainians would not put up significant resistance and it, it wasn't a crazy gamble uh it it that could have i think it could have come to pass and once again it goes back to this uncertainty right fundamentally the reputation of the west and the and the willingness of Ukrainians to not surrender but to fight was fundamentally uncertain, and and the problem with uncertainty is that it's really hard. And then I mean the West and the Ukrainians were strongly signaling, no 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 no, we are gonna, the sanctions will be unified, uh, we are going to be plucky and resist, and and that's exactly what came to pass. But but I think it's also difficult to believe those signals. It's sort of like it's like playing poker. Were they bluffing or not? Exactly. We can discuss this later in the conversation. We can return to this, some of the reasons, the five major reasons yeah. for war that you've identified. And of course, you've already discussed a bit of this uncertainty aspect, and which is particularly interesting in relation to the ongoing war, because you could say that the Russians did not really know or could not know, perhaps they should have known how strong Ukraine was, the resolve of the Ukrainian people, mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe because they didn't have timely or accurate information, they were not able to assess the risks, uh, you know, whatever. But we can return to some of these later, Chris. Before we talk about the, the roots of war, there's one issue I wanted to ask you, and that has to do with visible and invisible forms of violence. So yeah. I've been studying Malawi for many years, and just after like 16 years, I realized that Malawi is, of course, on paper, on the surface, one of the most peaceful societies. There's no conflict. But the more I get to know the country, the more I visit it, the more I speak with people, there's this feeling that there is beneath that surface mm -hmm. a seething rage against uh -huh. elites. It could be against Asian minorities. It could be against some other person in the community. Now, this does not necessarily, this rage, spill over into a visible form of conflict. Yeah. But beneath the surface, people are pretty angry at each other. And so yeah. one way in which this pans out is by this widespread resort to witchcraft or healers. Mm. And you tend to take out that anger through a consultation with a healer, which which doctor, and you can spread evil. Yeah. So the conflict doesn't result in the kind of fist fights that I was telling you about at school, but there is this the need to spread hate mm -hmm. or jealousy or evil through more invisible forms. And that is a type of violence, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So I, you know, in the book I say enemies prefer to loathe in peace. Mm -hmm. And so and and again, that this is this negative piece that you're describing. It well, technically we're not fighting, but it's just there's it's it's hateful. Yeah. It and 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 then it may come out. Th th that's the equivalent of these nefarious tactics. It's the meddling in the elections or the propaganda or the right that or the witchcraft or the it's there are all these things we do when we're hateful and polarized towards our adversaries that are costly and are miserable and just unpleasant, but they're not, it's not the same as violence, right? It's not the same as these pitched battles. So call it what you will, we could call it violence, we could call it nefarious tactics. I want to put like prolonged fighting in its own category yeah, because it's different. And, and I think we see that sometimes people dismiss that, but compare what's happening, you know, it's June when we're recording this, like 
the pitched battles, the tens of thousands of people dying, destruction in cities, the complete economic collapse, that is in a different category than all of the nasty stuff that was happening over the last 20 years. It's just orders of magnitude more terrible. And a, and a civil war in Malawi would be orders of magnitude more terrible than all of the nefarious polarized things that hateful enemies do towards one another in, in, in quote unquote peacetime. So of all the wicked problems in the world, wars are perhaps the most wicked of them all. Yeah. And I think and, and the other thing about a lot of these pieces, like when you have a when you have a country dominated by elites, yeah. especially a dictatorship, I'm not sure this is a, a a description of Malawi, but but a lot of societies have peace under the constant threat of repression, right? And that's a kind of violence. Whenever the majority sorry, whenever a, any group, whether they're majority or minority, sort of dominates another group, and, and, and that, that, that dominated group doesn't revolt violently, a lot of people call that violence. So are you thinking about like the Cold War, where, you know, it didn't really have a war, but it yeah. was threat of violence, threat of nuclear weapons, right? Yeah, that, well, that, that kind of like brinksmanship and living under the shadow of annihilation is miserable. And, but being dominated by a minority elite, through the constant threat and maybe use of repression is also miserable and violent. So I don't want to call that not violence, but I do want to distinguish that from this like all that warfare, all that warfare. And the sad truth is that for most of human history, most societies have had a small elite dominating the masses through the threat and occasional or maybe regular use of violent repression. But we won't we won't call that that's not warfare. And, and most of these societies don't have violent revolutions. Uh, the the masses are cowed, and so so peace doesn't have to be just, and it doesn't have to be happy. It's often quite miserable. That's this idea of negative peace, and 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 so part of the book is about how we get past that, because the closer we get towards a more what people call positive peace, interdependent and protective, like really really far from that brinksmanship, really really far from that everyday violent repression, the further we are from actually also a civil war or an international war breaking out or or an ethnic conflagration, like so so. That's hard. That's that's hard. The easy part is just stopping the pitched battles by comparison. That's the easy part. So let's dive into the book, The Five Major Categories of Reasons for War. You've mentioned intangible motives and uncertainty. Let's begin with unchecked interests, which in many ways is the key argument that it is the unaccountable, unchecked leader that is the problem, right? That a leader who has something to gain, something to profit from a war. So when the leader's private incentives are not aligned with those of society, then we have a problem, right? Yeah. So here, of course, the, you discuss this in the book too, the role of politics and the agency problem that we often face in many societies. We elect leaders, we as principals, the citizens, we elect leaders to be our agents and we hope that they will act in our interest. But often we end up in societies where the agent does not act in our interest. And I'm thinking about what's going on at the moment in the United States, which appears to be a very good example of this. You have the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the the United States Capitol is discussing the role that President Trump played in mobilizing a riot, an act of violence. And it seems that Trump here is one of those examples that you could potentially use, right, to talk about unchecked interests. Well, so, OK, I think I think that all leaders are unchecked to some degree. American leaders are checked. And maybe the whole problem with this country, this is one country on the planet where I think leaders are too checked. It's impossible to get anything done. It's even impossible to stage a real revolution. And that's the whole point, right? You can manage a riot. And that you know, it was a terrible event, it was just, but it was a single day of insurrection. Nothing like that has been repeated. It would have been very difficult to sustain. And that's American institutions were constructed to make this kind of sustained insurrection almost impossible. But every president does have the ability to create it has enough sort of insulation from accountability that they can create some short mayhem. People point to Clinton, 
trying to distract the world from his, you know, marital affairs by bombing Kosovo. Or that may or may not be true, but if it, it it's possible that it's true, right? Uh, the, uh, he could, he could, you know, uh, uh, you can imagine prime ministers and presidents who use executive authority to try to rally. They, they, it's called the rally, the rally around the flag effect. Now, it turns out that the rally around the flag effect doesn't seem to be very reliable. People don't really rally very long. And so it, it actually doesn't provide much of a political boost. Biden certainly hasn't received much of a boost from it's any boost he had was very temporary and, and, and has disappeared for in terms of his Ukraine support uh, already. So that's quite typical. But all you need is leaders to think that they get a boost. They they just have to believe in the rally effect for for that. So 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 you can have so you can have but but I I do think most democratically elected leaders are accountable enough that sustained violence is really rare. Yeah. But it seems that one could perhaps say that this this particular case with the insurrection has elements of, you know, the intangible interest that you were mentioning earlier appealing to some, I don't know, revenge or, or dominance by some other groups and elements of an unchecked leader yeah the, the other example you use which i found fascinating is george washington mm -hmm. so you have this portrayal of washington in very noble terms usually but you you show how there were very concrete self interest in terms of property etc yeah that were at stake and which were then addressed by you know going to fight with 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 the british colonial masters so the revolution yeah. so Despite all of these other noble claims, there were some some very mundane economic yeah. incentives at play, which is not very unusual from a Liberian warlord. Yeah, they also have similar interests in very different contexts. Well, th yeah, and throughout the book, I wanted to sort of show that it wasn't just like Liberian warlords and evil dictators from the other side of the planet that caused wars. I wanted people to see this in their own societies. I think that the main explanation for the American Revolution was an idealism, a, a decision to refute was an intangible incentive. So this other thing we talked about earlier, that that it there was the, basically the the compromise with Britain was repugnant. Arguably, you could make this that's the cause of the war today in Ukraine. And it, the Ukrainians find the idea of compromise with a superpower repugnant. Yeah, even though they're the weaker party. Uh, so there are a lot of parallels, and I think that's where you, why you see so much American support. But the unchecked leaders are very important because Washington at the time, and 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 I point to more the French Indian War, which he helped ignite, which later becomes the Seven Years' War. We can't ignore the fact that our founding fathers were elites, that they had a private stake in independence from Britain, and Washington in particular. Not only did he become one of the richest men in American history, uh, certainly maybe our richest president. He was just known. He was just a total, you know, he just loved land and he loved wealth and he loved fancy clothes and he loved his carriages. He was just this, he was totally obsessed with wealth and status his entire life. And that helped carry, you know, the colonies into this terrible war against the French because he was off, you know, you know, losing control of his troops as they scalp a bunch of French ambassadors in order to protect his spurious land claims. So, so you know, honor him for his nobility, but also remember that there is this darker side as there is with many leaders. In terms of just going back to this intangible interest that raised the risk of war, which is also another category for war, you know, I was thinking about my, my this whole revenge thing. You also touch upon it in the book, you know, like Hollywood movies, one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption, you know, it just mm -hmm. makes us feel good. Like when I was a child, I loved The Count of Monte Cristo. We like these things. So, so the importance of historical injustices, all of these non-material motives, higher ideals, all of these are important, right? So I'm, I'm just wondering, could you elaborate on how important you think it is sometimes to maintain our dignity, keeping our heads yeah. high? how that leads to war yeah so to put it in context every reason why we fight is a reason we ignore the costs we talked about one being leaders just aren't accountable for them but then there's might be times when we're just dignity vengeance whatever we're just willing to pay the price yeah. we know what the price is there's a cost of war we're not ignoring it but we're saying i will pay that for this 
this this ethereal thing that I get, which is glory or revenge. I think that this is a little, I think this is a little bit important for how leaders choose to go to war. So I think uh, I think I think the American founding fathers and the revolutionaries did believe in liberty. I think that Putin uh, did was thinking of glory for himself and for the Russian nation. So I think these things matter somewhat for a leader's calculus. It makes them willing to pay some costs of war. I think we exaggerate it. I think where it's very important is not in terms of why we fight, in terms of why do our leaders ignite wars. It's 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 almost I could write a different book about how we fight. Yeah, and how we and and how we fight is by convincing our populations to that is legitimate. That it's legit. Well, a that it's legitimate, but but you know, you mentioned agency problems. Like you have to get soldiers to show up for every day, meaning you have to solve the participation constraint, and then you have to get them to work hard, right? You have to solve the incentive compatibility constraint, and you have to get everybody in the society to solve the same. You have to do the same things to get them to contribute to the war and support you, and you could do that by paying them. Or you could do that by convincing them that they get like intrinsic rewards, right? And that, so this is what organizations love to do. They love to give us intrinsic incentives to let follow the leader because extrinsic incentives are very expensive. So that's why I think the Campesino example in, uh, yeah. in El Salvador is such a great one, right? You're not yeah. getting a tangible benefit, but you're doing this in, in solidarity with your comrades. Correct. That's the, I mean, that's, and we have to be aware, you know, I think we're, you know, I'm I'm a sincere supporter of Ukraine's resistance and American support for it, but I also recognize that we're all being manipulated in a very skillful way. The information war is really being won by the Ukrainian government and some of its elite supporters, in that they've they've successfully mobilized an immense amount of support by creating these intangible incentives, right? They're solving these problems in a very skillful way. Their use of social media is masterful. And so I, I'm also aware, you know, I, I'm supportive in spite of knowing that we're being manipulated. I don't know that everyone else is just so aware, but, and that's just common. That's just how it is. That's every conflict is like. But you know, that reminds me of uh, one of my mentors in political science many years ago told me that, you know, be wary of, all kinds of reports criticizing North Korea all the time. Yeah. That remember that much of the way in which we understand North Korea is based on South Korean propaganda. You know, so exactly. it, 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 we have to be careful. Well, and just on that, I want to know. Like you've mentioned some of like India and, and some of the and the riots. Um, yeah, Paul Brass, this famous scholar. Yeah, he just died recently. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, how tragic. Yeah. He uh, he called this. I believe he he can he, he coined the term the institutionalized riot machine. That that we need it's the Fox Newses of the world and the MSNBCs of the world, which are our radical stations here in the U.S. Or the 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 those the every every country has their sort of more extreme media sources. They're constantly stoking anger, right? They're trying to create that rage between both sides and that sense of injustice. Because then when you want to ask for something, follow me, you know, over the trenches to like, then they follow you, right? And so this is a really common, this is what political elites do. That's why I'm suspicious. I think sometimes political elites believe their own rhetoric and they're pursuing these intangibles. They convince themselves of their own propaganda or they, or we put people in office who believe the propaganda. But mostly I think these things are how we build bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis our adversary and get people to fight when really it's against the group's interests. But it also appears, Chris, that we may derive a lot of pleasure and satisfaction by punishing others. Yeah, it, handing out some sort of uh, beating, punishment for past, you know, crimes or or being treated unfairly, and so we can't underestimate that sense of satisfaction that we derive as humans. So that's true, but and, and but we and we shouldn't. Our leader, in fact, it's a bargaining tactic. If there's if the cost of war means there's a whole range of bargains that we should accept rather than fighting. But some of them are quite, quite disadvantageous to us, right? That could be just better to our, our adversary. So if I'm a skillful leader, then what I want to do is I want to stoke the rage machine. I want to convince my population that a whole range of these so-called acceptable bargains are actually unacceptable for ideological reasons. Mm -hmm. And that will narrow the bargaining range in my favor, meaning it will push the range of remaining bargains to things that are unfavorable to the other side. 
So the other side says, well, I better do the same thing with my population. And we're going to now move this and, and we're going to move the bargaining range down to a sliver that works in favor of whoever is the more skillful propagandist of their own people. And this is really, and that happens all the time. And the problem is when both sides are so successful, maybe they lose control and that sliver disappears. And that that's 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 where we we'll see where we are in the next couple of months, but that's where we may end up in this in this conflict with Ukraine and Russia, is both sides have so successfully convinced their people that compromise is unacceptable that 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 this terrible thing goes on. It's fascinating to see reports now, you know, emerging increasingly. You know, what if Ukraine wins? Yeah. You know, what are the possible future scenarios? Because all this time we were thinking it was inevitable that they would, uh, the Russians are more powerful and would win. Yeah. I mean, that's a little bit, I mean, it's certainly, it's not, and it's within the realm of possibility. The, I think, I think there's a certain amount of delusion and propaganda going on there. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, the, it, it's, this is a very, I, I will just say that this is a very common thing that happens in conflicts is that is that it's it's in the interests of each side to convince its its sides of of of, of this elusive victory and and so you mean the problem of overconfidence in many ways it can be well it's a, it, it's a, it can actually be a strategic tactic again by elites to to say so, so what, what you very often I, it could be it could be it could be a mistake very often in civil wars international wars. The moment before a negotiation is the most violent moment because both sides decide to just throw it all in there to see if they can improve their bargaining position. But then usually there's no change, real. It's it's just a big gamble, and it's super wasteful and destructive in in horrible terms. Maybe that's irrational. I mean, we've been talking about we've talked about unchecked leaders. We've talked about these intangibles. We've talked about uncertainty leading to wars. But then this other one is you can just be mistaken. You can be overconfident. You can underestimate the costs. You can overestimate your chances of victory. This is very common. There are certain, it's not emotion, I think, that clouds our judgment in these situations. Of course, emotion matters. I think there's some systematic mistakes that are either psychological or institutionalized that a lot of uh, military bureaucracies and political elites make. Yeah, I think this really relates to that that misperceptions category that you that you mm-hmm. talk about. That it assumes that others think like us. That yeah. it's this confirmation bias. Maybe uh, we are stubborn. We 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 may even refuse to see somebody our opponent's point of view. Yeah. We are thinking fast. We are reacting. We are selfish. We are demonizing our enemies. All of yeah. this contributes, right? And I think one particularly fascinating example in the book is the case of the IRA, the Northern Ireland conflicts yeah. that, that you that you write about in Belfast that I think you visited and you mm-hmm. you studied this, right? So there was absolutely no room for compromise. It was yeah. it was us and it was them and you there was no acceptance that the other party had any valid reason. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I sort of, what I try to do is sort of say like there's a lot of behavioral psychology and science and economics about the mistakes we make systematically um but the the a lot of the stuff we study like why we buy gym memberships we don't use or and all these other sorts i don't really make a lot of sense in understanding warfare they're not very high stakes decisions they're not repeated decisions often they're not made in groups and and so i want and they're not they're not strategic they're not like decisions that we're making in interaction with others which is really key so i wanted us to i wanted to sort of say well what's this what's the set of behavioral science and psychology that helps us understand how groups strategically make mistakes. And so one, as you mentioned, is overconfidence. I think when we underestimate the costs, overestimate probabilities of victory, and I talk a lot about that. And the other is this systematic misperception of the other group, what their interests are, what their, how they will interpret our actions and how we just get the, we basically just look down the game tree and we just see the wrong game tree. And 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 but and we do so in the same way over and over and over again. And it's true for Northern Uganda. It's true for this war right now that's going on. And so I wanted people to focus on that. There's less research on that. We don't do a lot of good research on strategic behavioral biases. I think behavioral game theory needs more work. 
final set of issues related to these five logics of war is the commitment problem, which of course relates to when an agreement, a deal, an arrangement fails, when one party can't trust the other party, whether this other party will honor this agreement in the future. So Chris, help us understand a concept that you use in the book, the concept of preventive war, that, yeah. that one country or a group, we are powerful today, we feel we are powerful, but we also know that we may not be powerful for very long, that maybe our rivals, our enemies will soon become more powerful. So it's best to attack our enemies now so that we actually combat their rise, we prevent yeah. them from becoming powerful. And one concrete example of you discussed throughout is, of course, Saddam Hussein, the Iraq war, the yeah. US action to it. So, so help us understand this concept of preventive war and how that leads to this, this commitment problem. Yeah, commitment problems are a really deep and important idea that are maybe the least, the public's least aware of them. And even most political scientists and economists, I think, think about them incompletely or maybe even wrongly. They help us understand why wars break out and they understand help us understand why they are hard to stop once they do break out. Let me let me use the example of the current example with, with Russia and Ukraine, where you could make an argument that in late 2021. Russia was at its peak leverage versus vis-a-vis -vis the West and Ukraine. Its economy was stagnating. The Ukraine had nowhere to go but up in terms of its economy because it was so had been so terrible. Uh, they'd been acquiring more and more def defensive weaponry, not necessarily from NATO, building it themselves and acquiring Turkish drones and things of this nature. And and more importantly, Ukraine was growing closer closer and closer to the West in terms of its inclination to join the EU, it putting NATO in the constitution, NATO membership in the constitution, and, and, and more and more sympathetic towards with less and less support for Russia. And so there's this inexorable trend where, where Russia can sort of say, well, they can't, we'd, what we'd like to do, what Russia was trying to do was to say, stop, stop moving towards democracy, stop moving towards the West, stop acquiring weapons, because this is profoundly threatening to us. And if you do stop, we won't invade. And it's just not clear that a Ukrainian leader could agree to stop. How do you do that? How do you agree not to arm yourself? How do you, you know, and if he did agree, he'd probably be turfed out. Zelensky was extremely unpopular before this war. So these are commitment problems. And and in seeing where this war could end, there are commitment problems because everyone's worried that if we sort of pause, negotiate a solution, or even have a frozen conflict and stop fighting, that Russia is just going to remobilize and attack again. People don't believe that Russia can commit to, to not just regroup and attack. And Russia yeah. looks at Ukraine and said, we had an agreement. We have these Minsk Accords that you said you weren't going to do all these things that you then did. And you couldn't, because your parliament wouldn't ratify them and your people wouldn't support the Minsk Accords. We can't deal with Ukrainian politicians because they can't credibly commit to a deal. And, and so we're at war and we're at continued war because of the lack of reliability of either side. And so this is a really common feature of, of war. It's interesting, the commitment, we're seeing two commitment problems here. The commitment problem on the Russian side is nobody trusts Putin's private interests and, 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 and intangible incentives. And on the and the Russians don't trust the the Ukraine's political process and their ability to make a deal because of they're too constrained in some ways and and there isn't popular support for concession. So so these commitment problems are so fundamental, and and they do help us understand everything from World War II to the Iraq War and on and on and on. Um, and 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 that to me is maybe maybe the most important chapter in the book because because there's, it's so poorly understood, and yet it's so fundamental to every peace process. The other aspect about that chapter that I really liked is, is how in many societies, increasingly, we see the fears of an encroaching and growing minority, mm -hmm. what they will do. And so we have clashes in India, we were discussing the Hindu Muslim things, there's always this fear that the minority is getting more and more powerful, so one has to react. In the worst case scenario, this was the, you know, is the Rwandan genocide, yeah. where you had millions of Tutsis being butchered by the Hutus. And so again, that I think is like the worst form of that, that, that commitment problem. 
Yeah, I think that's that's another genocide and mass killings are a tactic. They're they're a last resort, and of course they're driven by hatreds, but often they're they they almost always happen in the context of a civil war, and they're often a, a quote their final solution in the sense of of saying, "This is our la- you 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 the majority or you this." opposition group can't commit not to use your power against us in future um and because you can't commit our optimal strategy uh not our hate and loathe filled strategy though that helps our optimal strategy is to try to exterminate you before that threat becomes real and and so it's this cold strategic logic that scholars of genocide are just are constantly having to point out against this sort of journalistic view that it's all about hatreds and ancient ethnic blah 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 We talked a lot about war. Let's talk a bit more about peace. Yeah. And towards the end of the book, you come up with your 10 peaceful commandments. Yeah. And these relate to being able to distinguish between what are easy from difficult problems. Uh, we shouldn't ignore everyday politics in policy making, making sure that our actions actually have an impact. we ought to embrace failure we have to be patient we shouldn't formulate nonsensical unrealistic goals most importantly of course we have to prioritize accountability and we've talked about this in relation to unchecked leaders but one of the 10 peaceful commandments i liked particularly relates to a friend of ours jim scott yeah and jim's been my mentor and you refer of course to to seeing like a state is book and one of the commandments you formulate is to avoid worshiping grand plans and i wondered if you could elaborate on that principle or any of the other 10 commandments as to why these grand plans and you refer to this one quote that jim has the despot is not the man it is the plan so so what is it about these plans these grand visions that we should avoid in terms of this this pursuit of peace. Yeah, I mean the way I ended the book was like, you know, a lot of books like mine die in the last chapter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they die for a couple reasons. One is well, maybe they're just boring and they just resummarize what the whole book said. I didn't want to do that. They also die because they sort of are like, well, okay, now that we understand why war happens, here's the 10 step plan to peace. <laughs> yeah. and and everything will get better and i i didn't i didn't want to write that chapter mostly because it's not true because there isn't a 10 step plan for peace everywhere that i i i sort of sat down and i reflected and i said it's a little bit like being a doctor i can't like write a book about why people get sick like i couldn't write a book like says why we sick why we get sick and then like in the last chapter say here's the 10 step plan for everybody should get Tylenol and radiotherapy you know, yeah. that just wouldn't it would be bizarre right it would be totally false you would end a book called why we're sick that says well we need to have really good doctors who get trained in diagnosis and who are not giving everyone radiotherapy and Tylenol but are actually like using have a good theory of why we're sick and then are able to sort of through trial and error figure out why each individual is sick and then what treatment will help them with some basic principles and 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 generalizations but every it's complex and every every person is going to be different and so that is the last chapter i had to write which is not as satisfying and and is not the natural instinct of a lot of peacemakers and bureaucrats and so i had to write a, i had to channel jim scott who and who and all these thinkers who not in conflict but in other realms of policy have said development is complex you know cities are complex all these you know medicine is complex scientific advance is complex and on in these complex problems we've only ever made progress by being like these doctors these engaging in trial and error careful diagnosis knowing what we don't know uh and what Karl Popper called piecemeal engineering and so that's how i ended i call i say we all, we have to be piecemeal engineers where my little my sort of dad joke is i spell peace as p e e c e so it's not like this inspiring message i don't i don't really expect to go to washington and see a bunch of people wearing piecemeal engineer t-shirts but but that's kind that's what i think people have to do people have to sort of re- realize they're a little bit like doctors and and that that they 
then they're, they're not going to just, there's a 10 step plan to peace all over the world. They're going to have to figure it out every time. I think really the most important message, and I think you do a very good job in the last uh, chapter too, it isn't boring. I think the most important message is that we are all actually, or we should aim, we should strive for polycentric peace. There's this yeah. polycentric governance aspect, right? That the more constrained societies are, the more peaceful they are. You said the United States, I, I know you're Canadian, the United States is, you said the leaders are very constrained, maybe too much. Yeah. I suppose one advantage is that you could have some sort of peace, but that could result in ineffective governance. Yeah. That could re result in polarization, etc. But at least there is peace. Or yeah. is that how you know you see it? Is it the polycentric peace concept that really is is the key here? I think, I mean, I, I think so. You, the US, I, there aren't many places I say, I would say have taken it too far. The US might be the only one. Yeah, I, I, I think like polycentric just means checks and balances. You know, it means that power that, you know, that leaders are constrained by an independent bureaucracy, by treaties they've signed, by international agreements, by by other branches of government, by lower, by states. And the fact that like, may, you know, if mayors and state governors you know, aren't a pain in the butt to you as a president, then something's wrong, right? Because, because it means you're not checked enough. And, and that unchecked power causes, is the fundamental, you know, we talked about the five reasons for war, the concentrated power makes all of them worse. The, the leaders unchecked, we're subject to their intangible incentives, we're subject to their misperceptions. It's uncertain what's going on in the minds of these despots. And then by definition, dictators can't make credible commitments. And so, so it's like the worst and so which is why checks and balances is one of the core solutions which is a complex problem that every society has to figure out on their own so so yeah and then i call it the polycentric piece i don't know because i want to combat this idea of a democratic piece i don't believe in the democratic piece i don't think it's about elections i think it's about checking and balancing power and 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 and, and some societies have gotten there and good for them more societies need to happen I don't think we'd be in this conflict today if Putin were more checked. But not just, not as a Democrat. Even, I, gosh, even if we had a plutocracy in Russia, we probably wouldn't have found ourselves in this mess. So so I, I do try to focus people on that, laser focus on, on decentralizing, not centralizing power. Chris, I really enjoyed reading your book. Fantastic book, Why We Fight. And it was such a pleasure to chat with you today. Thanks so much for coming on my show. No, thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.